I've recently decided to have a go at making a pocket watch movement from scratch. Since this is my first watch, the design of the movement is based on the George Daniels Spring Detent Chronometer Tourbillon watch, although I have tweaked some aspects of the design. In this video I show how I made the tourbillon bridge, plus some of the other similar components in the watch movement. The purpose of the bridge is to support the tourbillon carriage, which contains the escapement and the balance wheel. This assembly is the most important part of the watch, and certainly the most difficult to make. As I've demonstrated in previous videos, the pantograph is a great way to machine parts like this without a CNC milling machine, and is a tool I will be fully utilising throughout this watch project. Once the holes have been drilled for the bridge, and the shape formed using the pantograph, I begin the hand filing work. I give the edges a quick polish, although I will be revisiting this later on. The same goes for the top and bottom faces. This is a smaller bridge designed to support the third wheel. Daniels used a potence instead of a bridge for this, which is essentially a bridge, but screwed down only on one side. I think the potence is easier to make, but I prefer the aesthetics of the bridge here. The click and click spring are made in much the same way. I use the pantograph to rough out the shape, and then finish the parts using files and emery paper. Watch parts are usually heat treated. This process promotes the formation of a hard phase in the steel called martensite. The problem is, as the steel is heated, it reacts with the oxygen in the atmosphere. Traditionally, I've encapsulated the part in boric acid, although an old watchmaker's trick is to use charcoal powder instead, so I gave it a go. It worked okay, although it still left a black residue on the surface of the part, so I think I will be sticking to boric acid in the future. I temper the parts to an appropriate hardness. For the click, I decided to stop shy of blue, although I might revisit this later and take it a bit further. I tempered the spring to blue. Now I've talked about lapping plates in a recent Patreon video, but let me cover it again briefly here. To polish the visible surfaces accurately, a lapping plate is made from a soft material, such as copper or tin. This is important to not only achieve a good surface finish, but also an accurately flat surface. This is because, perhaps counterintuitively, the soft lap wears much slower than the harder part being polished, due to the way the diamond particles embed themselves within the soft material. Now when held in the right light, you can see here the click needs some more work before it's completely flat. With a 1 micron diamond suspension on a tin lap, I take the click to a black polish and you can see from the reflection of the machining marks on the lap, this surface is also nice and flat, with no distortion of the reflection near the edges of the part. 
The next stage of the tourbillon bridge is on the watchmaker's lathe where the centre hole is bored accurately to size for a dual setting, and the underneath of the bridge is then recessed. I begin by screwing the faceplate onto the lathe spindle and check it's accurately mounted. The bridge is held by these finger clamps and centred. Before the days of cheap indicators, watchmakers traditionally used a wobbler stick, which is basically a lever supported at one end by the hole in the bridge, with a fulcrum close to this hole. The other end of the stick then shows the eccentricity of the hole magnified. A much better approach though is to use a long piece of ground steel, which is centre drilled at one end to be supported in the tailstock, and pointed at the other to locate in the bridge hole. The indicator can then be used directly on the rod. For the final measurement, the rod is prevented from rotating to remove any eccentricity error in the rod itself. The hole in the middle of the big bridge is bored to 3mm, which is too small for my 3 point bore micrometers, which go down to 3.5mm. In these cases we have to use pin gauges. These are accurately ground in 20 micron increments, which provides enough resolution to bore the hole to the correct size. Now in this case I bore the hole so the 2.99mm pin gauge is a snug fit. I can then make the setting to 3.000mm and I know it will be a perfect press fit. Two recesses are machined using a boring tool. To clean up the machining marks, these degusset stones are ideal. They make a good emery paper alternative for these small fiddly parts. These stones are primarily made from aluminium oxide, but the red colour is the result of chromium, which is also why rubies are red. I like to use buff files if I need something a bit coarser than degusset, but not as coarse as a traditional file. Whilst jewels can be pressed straight into the component, they are also often pressed into a setting, which is a separate ring around the jewel. The main purpose of a jewel setting is for aesthetics, so for the large obvious jewels, such as the one in this bridge, I intend to use a setting but the smaller ones I will probably press direct into the component. I make the setting from brass to provide contrast against the steel of the bridge. As with all the components after polishing, I clean off any excess polishing compound in IPA using an ultrasonic cleaner. These tea infusion baskets work nicely for holding small parts in the solvent. I now begin on the finer finishing work. A stereo microscope helps me see the minute details on the part. I carefully bevel the edges and finish by black polishing the top face of the bridge. I use finger cots when handling the components at this stage to prevent finger grease and grit from damaging the part. I'm still undecided on the best time to complete the final finish on the component. I think for future components I will leave final finishing until the end of the project, and I noticed that George Daniels used this approach, because as a watch is constructed, parts will inevitably become scratched and oxidised from handling. Also, there's a good chance parts will have to be remade, so spending time on finishing would then be wasted, and finishing by hand is very time consuming. To clean parts before using the ultrasonic cleaner, I wipe off excess polishing fluid with optical cleaning cloths to make sure the surface isn't scratched.
Watchmakers refer to this finish as a black polish, because the surface imperfections are so small that the polished face looks either white or black depending on the direction of the reflected light. Because black polishing is so time consuming you will not see black polished parts in mass produced watch movements, and is reserved for high end watches only. The bridge here is not perfect yet, so I clearly need some more practice with this technique. With the bridge finished well enough at this stage, it's time to make a pusher for the duelling press. I made two pushers, one for the setting which you see here, and one for the duel which I made in last month's Patreon video. The pusher for the duel is spring loaded, but the setting pusher is very simple with a small stub to locate in the setting hole. Before we press the brass setting into position, the height stop on the duelling press is first set by contacting the bridge with the pusher and then turning the micrometer stop until it touches the lever. The setting is then pressed into position with a satisfying snap. When I made the setting I bored it slightly undersized so the finished jewel hole can be reamed to 1.99mm, which is 10 microns smaller than the jewel diameter. These specialist reamers can be purchased or we can save some money by making them. This is a simple job, first requiring a slight taper to be machined on a piece of silver steel. In this case the silver steel is 2mm, so the final diameter of 1.99mm can simply be polished from the ground surface. The reamer is then hardened and tempered to a straw colour and then finished in the D-bit grinder. Firstly a flat is ground on the reamer to the halfway point and then I grind a 20 degree relief behind the cutting edge. The final hole diameter is burnished to size by the short parallel portion of the reamer which is left untouched by the grinder. To hold the reamer I use my universal pillar tool designed by George Thomas. I made this years ago and it's been invaluable for the watch project so far. The sensitive drilling attachment is great for drilling those tiny holes, and I've comfortably tapped holes down to 0.6mm with the tapping attachment. The jewel can now be pressed into the setting in the dueling press. The spring loaded point in the centre of the pusher helps centralise the jewel before it's pressed into position. Before the bridge can be mounted to the watch plate, two pillars need to be turned in the watchmaker's lathe to support both ends of the bridge. The main profile of a pillar is turned and polished in the machine. Now I've spent many hours experimenting with polishing in the lathe, but I've struggled to get really good results. I think this is because in the lathe you have no choice but to polish in the same direction with each grade, and so scratches from the previous grade are hard to remove. I've certainly never managed to achieve even close to a black polish like this, so if anybody has any thoughts on how I can improve polishing in the lathe, please let me know in the comments.
On the end of each pillar I machine a short stub. This is designed to help locate the bridge, since it needs to be accurately mounted so the jeweled bearing in the bridge aligns with the bearing in the watch plate. If the bearings are even just slightly misaligned the watch simply won't run because the engagement between the fourth wheel and escape wheel pinion will be inconsistent and the clearances between the tourbillon carriage and obstructions on the main plate are very small. Normally a watchmaker would bore the hole in the main plate and the bridge concurrently in situ, but the problem with this method is that it's difficult to remake a component since it can't be made to measurement. So instead I'm attempting to make each individual part very carefully and I'm hoping I can achieve the tolerance as required. One of the key dimensions is the pillar length. I'm targeting 5.8mm and you can see from this measurement that I still have 0.115 to remove. One of the challenges when using a die to cut small threads is knowing when to stop. Ideally the thread should finish as close to the shoulder as possible, but it can be easy to break the workpiece off in the die if we aren't careful. This is where the microscope comes in handy because I can zoom right into the shoulder as I bring the die to the end of the thread. I tap the corresponding threads in the main plate ready to accept the pillars. I use brass faced pliers to secure the pillars in place. The bridge snaps nicely onto the pillar bosses and two M1 screws secure it. I'm leaving all the screws unfinished as I build the watch because they will be screwed and unscrewed many times. I may choose to remake them at the end of the project for the final assembly, we shall see when the time comes. Clocks and watches embrace a wide range of scientific concepts to accurately measure the passage of time. If you want to explore them further, check out this video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant helps you get smarter every day with thousands of interactive lessons in maths, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. Brilliant helps you build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not mindless memorization. Whether you're satisfying your own curiosity or upskilling for your career, learning a little every day is one of the best ways to keep your mind sharp. Brilliant science courses help you understand our world by exploring physical principles, whether that's the gear systems and mechanical clocks, or the electronic circuits and digital watches. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Cronova Engineering, scan the QR code on screen, or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. As always, thanks for watching.